Okay, so uh, we can now um, start directly with uh, our first invited speaker for today. Um, I, I see that Hilde is already here. Hey, Hilde, how is it going? Yeah, very well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, can you uh, can you uh, try start sharing your screen? Yeah, can go ahead. Awesome. So um, now, um, now I have my uh, pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Hildegard Kuna. Um, so Hilda is a professor for computer vision and machine learning, splitting her time between the University of Frankfurt as a co-director of the Computational Vision and Artificial Intelligence Group and um, the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. Um, Hilde received her doctoral degree in engineering from Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and afterwards she was um, working as a researcher at Fraunhofer Society, and later on also as a postdoc at the Computer Vision Group um, at the University of, uh, of Bonn. And uh, Hilde has a really impressive publication record, especially on video-related topics such as action recognition, temporal segmentation, and, and retrieval, and usually all this in combination with weak unsupervised or self-supervised learning method. So today Hilde will talk about spatial temporal action localization in unstreamed videos under uh, real-time requirements, and this is exactly a topic that is very relevant to this uh, workshop. And um, this is also why we are very happy to have uh, Hilde here today, and we are super excited to learn more um, more about your research. Okay, thanks so much, uh, and thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, I guess I can just get going. So um, my plan uh, for today is kind of like first to um, start with some general thoughts about my take on video understanding. And with this respect, I really like the introduction because I guess my view will echo a lot of points that we have heard about um, those 15 minutes. Um, then I'm actually happy to tell you a bit about the adventures of our team at the Diva Challenge, which is um, the spatial temporal action localization. Um, I will go a bit bit slightly over um, our works for efficient action recognition, which is related to that. And then hopefully I will have some time to cover what we are actually missing at the moment and hopefully also some ideas of how we can probably fix some stuff or kind of like fill some holes that we have at the moment in this whole pipeline. Okay, so um, the reason I actually want to start with video understanding is because yesterday I had the pleasure to give another talk at the workshop on oh, no, a tutorial for holistic video understanding. And obviously, the question there is always um, what is video understanding at all? Or what do we mean with video understanding? And the interesting thing about video understanding, if we just would have to draw a line, um, there are so many different disciplines working in this broad field. So we have people who are kind of like more, we have work more on the image side. So people who are doing semantic segmentation, object detection, who are fine with working on one frame. Um, then we have some middle ground where we have uh, video object tracking, post tracking, representation learning, multi object tracking. So people who are already kind of like working with some more frames. And then we have um, fields like action classification, temporal action detection, spatial temporal action detection, and finally temporal action segmentation, which are then working with like lots and lots of frames. And this is not even touching, and I hope you can see it, this is not even touching the people working in activity, understanding, reasoning, or other fields which actually even require more data. And you already get an idea, um, the way I sorted things on this line is actually kind of like a bit based on the number of frames um, that people actually need to do their job here. And um, this is not just kind of like a practical nuisance in this whole spectrum, it's actually, it actually has some really important consequences for the work that people do. And um, the important, or that's probably more interesting way to think about it is that people who are working more on the image-based spectrum, um, they have kind of like some advantages compared to the people on the other side. And this is just the fact that they can work image-based. And um, obviously we all need as much data as we can have, but technically um, one thing that where you're kind of like a lucky person when you work on the image side is that technically you usually have to deal with less variation. 
Um, just to give you an example, when you want to do action classification, you actually have to think about is the car now turning left or right? If you do just object detection, a car is always a car. It doesn't matter if it goes, if it goes right, left, starts, reverses, it's always the same stuff. Um, another thing that's kind of like related to this image-based um, thing is, um, Obviously, you don't have enough data, but technically you still have more data than other people, um, just because images are very easy kind of like data type. Um, lots of people take images on their phones and um, you kind of like probably have way more images on the internet available for download right away than um, videos. And um, this, let's say, easy data type also comes with the kind of like advantage that you can get annotations probably also not the easy way, but at least in a direct way, because most tools that we have to actually annotate data are kind of like made for 2D RGB vision. And as you kind of like have data that's 2D and RGB, it's something that people can display on their, on their screen and that they can easily manipulate, let's say with two mouse clicks and you have a bounding box. Um, now, when we think of people working on the other side of the spectrum, it gets more tricky um, because here now you have to deal with more frames. And this means obviously more variations, but it also means that you technically have uh, less data to start with, um, mainly because, as I said, there are not so many videos on the Internet. And if I, for example, would have to search for videos that are kind of like representing a special action, it might be more tricky than searching for images of, let's say, um, guinea pigs or bananas or whatever. Um, another thing that's related to that, it's not only that we have less videos to start with in general available, it's also that the annotation is much more expensive, which means we also have in general less annotation available. Um, and to give you an idea of how this works, um, think about the car. If you want to detect cars and you need bounding boxes around cars to annotate a car in an image, you need two clicks. So you have like you mark one corner and then you draw and then you mark the other corner. Um, now, when you want to annotate actions of the same car, like car turning left or right, uh, let's say you want to annotate five or 10 seconds, um, five seconds and uh, one second corresponds to 30 frames. That means 150, more, 150 times more clicks than you actually need to annotate one bounding box in one image. And obviously you have a huge scaling issue when you're going down this road. So um, this kind of like um, leaves us with the problem that um, people on this end of the spectrum have the problem technically they would need more data to cover to do their job, but it's also much harder to get them this data or even get them data comparable to what you can do on the image based side. Um, so this is one problem that we kind of like have a bit at the moment in video understanding, um, but there's also one more, and this is that those um, disciplines all are kind of like unrelated at the moment. And this is something what I really appreciate about this workshop, that um, you're one of the guys who are actually trying to combine some of those ideas. Obviously not all, but at least it's a good step in the right direction to say, okay, we take this, this and that, and now we try to frame all of this in one workshop. And um, technically um, at the moment, uh, our problem of video understanding kind of like is more similar to the story of the blind man and the elephant. So we have all those different disciplines and they are all kind of like looking at special problems um, or at special kind of like angles of um, our big elephant. And I don't exclude myself, I'm actually here at the tail um, because I'm doing mainly temporal action detection segmentation stuff. So I also don't see um, anything at the front end of the elephant at the moment. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of like the, the status a bit that we have. And um, perhaps I can give you some idea how we can get better in this. Um, but before I go into that, um, or perhaps to kind of like conclude this first, um, 
perhaps the idea of video understanding is that technically we all want the same and it just looks different from time to time. So in this case, um, you can see here the videos of the workshop where it's kind of like all about segmentation. And technically what I'm doing looks a bit like that. So where we have a video and obviously we don't care so much about every pixel at the moment. What we actually want to do is we want to draw bounding boxes um, when people are actually doing relevant things in the video, like entering or exiting scene or picking up object or talking on phone, things like that. But when you look at it, you get an idea that it's probably different kind of like angle, but the underlying stuff is probably not so far away. So um, let's see, uh, let's have a look at what we do and um, how we do it. And um, this middle part will actually be about um, the work that we did. Um, so the, MI, uh, the IBM Purdue team at the Diva Challenge. And for all of those of you who have never heard about Diva, Diva stands for Deep Intermodal Video Analytics. And it's actually an IARPA program. And for everyone outside US, IAPA programs are US government projects, which usually are kind of like considered high risk, high, re high pay of research programs. And we have a lot of teams working on that. So we are just one out of, I guess, five, six teams. And um, the idea of this DIVA program is um, that we want to develop robust automatic activity recognition um, for multi-camera streaming environments. Um, uh, short form is mainly for surveillance settings. And um, those activity detection should be enriched with like person object detection, and it should work in forensic mode as well as in real time, which means um, our kind of like output should be provide should be able to provide information of the video in an offline version when you kind of like already record everything and you just search for something, as well as in real time when you want instant kind of like notification when something is happening. And um, this is kind of like how our system in this program looks like. Um, this is now a view of the forensic mode because it's a bit easier to grasp what's going on. So we have here a list of actions that we want to consider that you can choose from. And then we have here the video length and you can, for example, jump to the different action instances. If you are searching, for example, for an instance where person talks on a phone or a person exits the scene, um, you can just navigate through the video and you don't have to watch the whole full hours um, of um, surveillance camera footage. Um, so this is kind of like uh, how it works. Uh, now, um, the interesting thing is actually to get there what we do and probably even more what we don't do. Um, because technically what we have here is a spatial temporal detection part. And actually we are making our lives very easy with some respect. So for example, um, in contrast to many other systems that I usually tend to build, I have to say here, we don't do any form of temporal reasoning or temporal inference to actually get the timestamp right of the action. We mainly just sample chunks of uh, three seconds of each video. And then you can imagine in those chunks of uh, three frames, we mainly run detection in a grid based way, but this is mainly to kind of like adapt to this like uh, surveillance setting. And um, from this really plain YOLO detection, so nothing fancy right out of the box, um, we mainly get bounding box proposals for the objects we are interested in, like person, car, truck, bicycle, and so on. Um, obviously, we do the usual maximum suppression, filtering, and so on. Um, then we apply motion filtering to actually exclude all objects that don't move, because when a car is just standing in a parking lot, it's usually very boring. And um, then um, all we actually do is uh, we kind of like make the bounding boxes that we extracted square to adapt to the action classifier. So. Um, and then we got proposals and they go to action classification. And this is for how we finally get like our spatial temporal action classification instance. Um, so uh, technically you see the interesting part is actually not so much what we do, but what we don't do. So for, um, for the temporal part, we just take this chunking 
and actually it works well. And for the spatial part, we mainly use object detection right out of the shelf. And then actually all the heavy lifting is done by the action classification part, because the action classification gets all those proposals, which are technically already spatial temporally localized. And then it's just a decision, uh, is it an interesting class? Yes, no. And which one is it of the 32 that we actually have to recognize? Um, and then we kind of like do merging a bit of assembling and so on. Um, but this is mainly kind of the system. And um, the interesting part is we're actually doing very well with this very vanilla thing. And um, another good thing about Diva is, by the way, that we have a lot of different evaluations and a lot of different kind of like metrics. Um, so each team kind of like gets uh, to win the prize at some point. And um, our system does especially well for surprise activities. So activities where we which are actually trained on the evaluation server from which we don't have any information um, what they are or how, yeah, any information at all. It's just surprise activities. We don't know what it is. Um, but also just to um, give kudos to all the other teams that actually performing or on this challenge. Um, the most important leaderboard at the moment is probably for known activities. So for models that we train in-house and here uh, CMU is at the moment the leading one and if you're lucky you probably get to learn more about their system uh, later in the workshop um, okay so that's kind of like how the system works there's also a lot of research work actually around diva um, but in this case as i said diva has to be real time and therefore our research work is mainly focusing on real-time action recognition which as you can imagine is not so easy because state-of-the-art action recognition models usually are some crazy wide deep uh, 3D convolutional architectures, and they're usually the opposite of um, efficient and real time. Um, one work that um, my colleagues did in this context, uh, which is very interesting, and actually paper was published at this year's CVPR, is to kind of like um, do a deeper analysis of um, the action recognition models that we have at the moment. And the background for that is a bit that uh, we have a huge zoo at the moment of action classification models. And some of them work on 2D convolutions, some actually work on 3D convolutions, some actually separated those convolutions into some spatial 2D and 1D temporal filtering. And um, from all the publications that we have out there, it's actually very hard to tell what's really working and what's not. And therefore, my colleagues took on the work to build a unified framework that allows a fair comparison of all those models, meaning uh, they, have a un they have put in place a unified backbone, a unified data, unified pre-training, frame input, and so on. And um, this actually allows probably for the first time to really compare all those models that we have at the moment and also to have a closer look on how this different ways of temporal modeling that I said with 2D, 2D plus one, 3D and so on actually impact the overall performance and also how well those models do with respect to efficiency versus accuracy which is also an interesting point. And um, to just kind of like summarize the key findings here, and I hope you can see it. Um, so some things um, my colleagues found by taking, for example, different backbones and different data sets and testing kind of like different, how to say, um, basic benchmark models or basic um, lines of thought is um, that uh, technically um, even 2D models, so which are very efficient, um, which usually work with some temporal aggregation are able to outperform 3D models when you really normalize architecture and everything else. And um, actually the one of the best performing models in this case was TAM which stands for Temporal Adaptive Models, which is actually a model which just works on 2D convolutions. And it's a pretty cool paper that has a long history and it's finally published at this year's uh, ICCV. So uh, congrats to the authors for that one. We knew that it was good before actually. Um, but um, 
Beyond that, uh, looking at more aspects of this overall study, what you can see is also very intuitive that when you use more frames, all models usually also perform better. So accuracy goes up the more frames are used. Um, but, and this is also interesting, we have some data sets which are more dependent on time and some which are less dependent on time. And just looking at this curve, you can already guess which, are, which is which. Um, so we have data sets like something something, which highly rely on getting the temporal um, information right, which also benefit the most from having more frames. And then we have other data sets like kinetics and uh, moments in time, which are much more scene oriented. So where you already can grasp a lot of information by just looking at one frame. And obviously here, um, adding more frames to your system might help in some cases, but in some cases it can even hurt. And in most cases, it doesn't change accuracy at all. So um, this is kind of like another interesting thing. And then finally, which is related to this question, um, but does not really show on this table here, is that um, the way we actually sample our frames. So if you, for example, sample uniformly or densely um, matters, but only if we are dealing with a data set where time matters. So um, in this sense, these curves make a lot more, make kind of like give you a lot more information than just use more frames. They can also kind of like tell you um, when you have a data set where you can see that time is not really of relevance, then you can actually sample much more uh, frugally than when you have a data set where time is really an issue and where you might need then sampling. Um, so it's kind of like a lot of things that come together and that are actually very nicely um, broken down. So if you're interested in this aspect, please check out the paper. And um, beyond that, we also have done um, a lot of research actually with respect to other ways to make video more efficient. Um, we have different flavors of uh, networks that are actually built to avoid any let's say redundant computation, which range from dropping frames um, that are not needed to improve accuracy over um, choosing the right feature layer up to kind of like trying to get rid of any redundancy completely. So um, this is also an interesting line of work. If you're interested, uh, check it out. I guess most people, most papers have been published uh, this year and one was uh, ECCV 2020. And they all come with code, so they should be easy to plug and play with. Um, so that's kind of like the work that we have done, which is um, pretty cool. And actually, I'm, I'm very impressed with the um, results that all teams got in the Steva challenge. Um, but uh, kind of like thinking a bit about that, it's also good to see what we are missing at the moment. And um, what we are missing at the moment, which probably doesn't show so much from my talk, but it's definitely missing, I can tell you, is anything that's related to long-term activity recognition, uh, which means um, we have a lot of atomic actions like um, picking up object, closing door, um, getting out of car, which are kind of like very easy to grasp in those three second segments, but then we have some complex activities like stealing or purchasing. And technically to tell apart those two activities, you require something like temporal knowledge because technically the difference between stealing and purchasing is just someone actually approaches, let's say a table or, or something uh, where you have something to sell, um, taking the object, and then actually you have to follow the person and you have to figure out, is this person actually paying or is she, she just leaving, uh, leaving the room? Because that's actually in the end, the difference between stealing and purchasing. And um, this is something that we just don't do at the moment, um, mainly uh, because uh, the benchmark metrics don't kind of like how to say, uh, don't give you any add value in, in kind of like considering those long-term temporal things. Um, but technically it would be very helpful to get from like atomic spatial temporal action localization to real video understanding. Um, another thing that's actually related to that, and that's probably also related to the um, 
to the findings and systems that are built in context of this challenge here is everything related to long-term spatial temporal knowledge, which is also something what, which we just don't do at the moment. And here we are talking about complex actions such as abandoning back, um, which obviously means you have to be aware that there is a person and there is a back, and then obviously they go together for a long time. And then at some point, it's actually kind of like it's in terms of tracking, it's just a track separation. And um, things like that obviously can be uh, important for action recognition, if this is an action that you're after, but it's also important for any um, uh, forensic analysis um, that you want to do with those videos. And um, as I already said, to be able to have all this, we need to grab or we need to get a concept of uh, things like track separation when people are getting out of cars, abandoning bags. Or we also get a concept of merging when people are getting into a car or on a bike and driving away and all this, um, all the stuff that we don't have at the moment. And finally, and this would be kind of like uh, when we get all the stuff done uh, that I talked about first, if we get all those things right, uh, then we can actually start to, to talk about things like neurosymbolic reasoning in videos, where um, we can start with identifying atomic classes, for example, by self-supervised learning or unsupervised learning, and then um, actually think about how can we build representations to capture those kind of like entities working together, for example, in terms of knowledge graphs and so on. And um, now I actually have the pleasure to come back to my first slide. Um, the question is, why don't we do that, period? And the reason why we don't do that at the moment is mainly the reason um, that you can give for any computer vision researcher. Um, I don't, we don't have to write benchmarks at the moment. So we don't have anything at the moment that forces us to do that, even in context of DIVA. And we know if you want computer vision people to actually do something, you have to, to give them a benchmark and you have to give them data. So um, question is, why don't we have one of those benchmarks. And the problem is kind of like a bit tied to the story that I told in the beginning. Um, benchmarks mainly mean we need data and we need annotation. And to annotate such kind of like high level relations on um, kind of like um, such a long-term level obviously needs a lot of effort. And question is if it's actually even feasible. And um, this question is, if, is it feasible or can we do it, might actually be a bit related to this problem of collaboration, because technically um, the answer is if we start from scratch, probably no. If it would be easy, someone would have already done it. Um, but what we can probably think of with all the great work that's going on at the moment is if we can actually use the information that we get from all those people and from all those fields to start thinking about how we can bootstrap videos or data in a way to pre-process them so that we are able to annotate the high level things that we actually want at the moment. And for this one, obviously we need collaboration. And therefore I hope um, that my image with the elephant is actually wrong. And that this is probably more a better way to think about video understanding where we actually have all those fields working together. And with that, I'm actually very happy to thank all the people that work on this uh, work, uh, the team at IBM, as well as the team from Purdue, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, th thank you very much, Hilda, for this uh, wonderful and very interesting talk. So I would, I would uh, also encourage uh, all the participants to ask questions now. Um, so if there are not any questions from uh, from from public, then uh, maybe I would go ahead with one, or maybe it's you can interpret it as a question or comment. So I, I really found this 
Um, this point on um, w when you were talking about what is missing, you mentioned that what is missing, one of the things that's missing is long-term activity recognition. And you also mentioned here issues with, uh, with uh, metrics. And uh, we, we actually kind of noticed the same thing in multi-object uh, tracking community. So at some point, we actually noticed that the metrics that were being dominantly used were actually um, analyzing uh, object track recovery right so if you if you split the track into two and then recover the identity later you would kind of be penalized by that by uh, getting additional id switch so um so for, for example this was this was also one of the very interesting uh, interesting lessons from uh, um um from multi-object tracking community and uh, trying to uh, in encourage encourage development of of uh, trackers that um, are able to um, to, to consistently track objects and not split them into into several tracks. Uh, but in addition to that, what else do you think might might be missing here? Do you think that uh, that also we are not looking into right uh, network architectures, or uh, is are the current issues also related to the fact that it's just difficult to, um, to uh, in, in terms of hardware, for example, that it's difficult to uh, store video on uh, on GPUs and and so forth. Let's say I guess it's it's a problem on multiple levels. Um, the metrics is definitely one thing um, because for Diva we are also not penalized for or let's say uh, probably rather frame it the other way we are not rewarded for tracking. And then actually, as it's a challenge that looks at um, real time capabilities, we are actually punished when we take longer for processing the video that it actually takes. So when we have a five minute video, it means we have five minutes to process the video and every second that we take longer is actually kind of like penalized. And obviously in this setting, if you don't have to do something like tracking, then you just leave it um, because it's more efficient. And we decided to just throw all the kind of like um, runtime resources that we have to throw at action classifier. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, that you can easily do more when you consider, for example, tracking as part of this problem. Um, but then obviously you also have to annotate the tracks, which is not done at the moment, but which might probably be easy um, when we have good tracking and segmentation, and everything. And this is probably my idea about how to solve this problem that we can start using findings from all over the place to see how much pre-processing we can do and to see how much more we would need to actually get to the next level. So probably the right way to think about those benchmarks is, especially in my area where we are talking about tons of data, is uh, is more thinking about um, let's just throw everything at it that we already have instead of starting from scratch and then actually start from a high level and just put on top what we actually what we actually want to develop more on top of what we already have. Um, and beyond that, obviously, video always is kind of like suffering from um, huge data and not enough hardware, like um, GPU memory is always kind of like um, not enough and so on. But this is something which probably won't go away. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, awesome. Maybe just uh, just one one more question, if if I may. Um, uh, so, um, do you think that um, for um, for activity recognition or kind of problems you're working on, do we explicitly need uh, tracking inputs? Like, do we need a tracker to provide uh, um, to, to provide like you uh, to provide information to higher level modules, or do you think that we could also just um, directly train networks to recognize actions? Um, and tracking would uh, be implicit? Would... That's a good question. I don't know, to be honest. I know that some people actually tried um, spatial temporal action detection as a regression task. I think um, at the moment with the data we have, it, it's very hard because to, to formulate such tasks as an end-to-end -end learning problem, obviously you also need to be able to provide the data to, to kind of like train the network to capture all the information that it needs to get this right. And I think this is 
probably even more than the, the, the technical resources, the problem that we don't have the data to actually train such networks end to end. And this is actually also why I would say we still need tracking, um, or at the moment, definitely, to get the stuff right. And perhaps in, I don't know if it's a near or far future, perhaps we can use tracking and everything else together to have enough data to train those networks. Um, but this is definitely nothing that I would say is something that we could do right now. So there needs to be work done to get there. Yeah, it make, makes perfect sense, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, with this, I would like to <clears throat> thank you once more for uh, for this uh, wonderful talk. 